Uh, before I go any further, my name is Dr. Abubakar Sanogo. I teach in the Film Studies Department at Carleton University. It's really my great honor to welcome you really to this uh, series of discussions uh, that uh, try, as I said, to establish bridges between the university and the community, uh, to emphasize the relevance of research uh, that we do at university beyond, obviously, our own confines and beyond the ivory tower, as we often like to call it, and to really see the ways in which uh, the research that we do is able to speak to and potentially to affect the lives of people. And uh, obviously this year, uh, the year 2020 is one of the years that has made uh, the terms health and city more resonant than ever. Of course, with a combination of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it has revealed to many the ways in which systemic racism so profoundly structures our entire ways of life. To paraphrase uh, a British cultural theorist, Raymond Williams, uh, to such an extent that the very health of our polity, so the city understood broadly as the polity is really in question, and therefore leads uh, has to ask a number of really fundamental questions, one of the central ones being, can we breathe, can we live in the city, or is the city killing us both literally and metaphorically? The events of 2020, it seems to me, interpolate us to revisit the inextricable relationship between the university and the city. They demand of us uh, a, radical a radical, radical thinking, and indeed rethinking, um, as, uh, as immediate and long-term action uh, on the part of both. They ask us to explore more than ever the insights that the, the university work uh, may simply offer in terms of uh, the legibility of such a profoundly transformational moment. It also raises questions as to how the city and the more broader social formation may help inspire, indeed push the university to further participate and collaborate in transforming a racially uh, sutured and suffused polity into a proactively anti-racist one. So part of really the impetus behind this panel is to actually make anti-black racism visible, anti-racism uh, visible, feelable and purple. It is to make sure that we actually see and perceive the extent of racial rot, the ways in which racism really putrefies our ways of being, uh, to such an extent that we actually need to do something about it. Racism obviously is not a fiction, nor is it simply cool to take a stance about it. Racism is a deadly disease. It contaminates everything it touches. It contaminates everything that comes its way. It kills, it cripples, it destroys potential. It prevents society from achieving, societies from achieving their proper destinies. It clips wings, breaks legs, snuffs breath. It feeds off the blood of millions, indeed of billions. And so it is to try to really make sense of this that we assemble this wonderful panel uh, of people, of academics, and of course, um, um, important community members to really think through this moment, this really fundamental moment that we are going through, so that we make of it not simply a moment in time, because the momentness of the moment is rooted in really something deeply structural, deeply profound, deeply systemic, and it's that system that we are going to work toward bringing out uh, today and obviously actions toward transforming it. So before I introduce the panelists, it's my greatest honor to receive the president of Carlton University, Dr. Benoit Antoine Bacon, who has generously accepted uh, to be with us today, uh, to listen in, uh, to take uh, things in, so to speak. Uh, and so I wanted to at least share a few words about his background. Uh, president uh, Benoit Antoine Bacon is starting his third year as president of Carleton University. 
Over the past three years, he's championed a number of initiatives which aim to ensure that everyone could rightly feel they truly belong and fully belong at Carlton. He initiated the Strategic Indigenous Initiatives Community that developed the transformative Kinamak the Win strategy. He has also been a very visible advocate for mental health and wellness, sharing his own ongoing journey of recovering from childhood trauma, depression, and substance abuse. Over the last year, he's appointed Michael Charles as the inaugural Associate Vice President, Equity and Inclusive Communities, and worked with him to develop a broad and ambitious equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism institutional action plan that will be completed this fall. So we could have no better person, therefore, to talk to us about uh, this question, about the relationship of the university to this question of our time, in terms of making sense of our time. So I, I would like to, to give him the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sonogo, for your, your truly generous introduction. Merci beaucoup. Uh, good evening, everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with, uh, with everyone tonight. And uh, it's an honor to say uh, a few words. Uh, I do hope that everybody is safe and well uh, as we continue uh, to, uh, to do as well as we can uh, under, under difficult circumstances. Uh, let, let me start by uh, by start. Let me start with uh, with thanks uh, to FAS uh, for organizing this important event and for the whole series, uh, really, of, of healthy cities. Uh, uh, many thanks in advance as well to our three uh, panelists. I uh, I really look forward to your uh, to your remarks and if I may if I may offer a special welcome or maybe a welcome back. Uh, to City Councilor Rawson King, uh, thank you so much for being with us and uh, uh, and for your continued engagement with your alma mater. Uh, it really is appreciated. So the, the theme for tonight, uh, imagining an anti-racist city, is of course extremely timely. And uh, I, I think we all we all know uh, that since the killing of George Floyd, there, there's been a real renewed sense of purpose and urgency, I would say, uh, across the continent to take action to address historical wrongs and, and present day injustice. And I, I'd say tonight that we're fortunate that, that Carleton is a diverse community that has a history of striving to inclusion, but we're part of the broader world and we're in no way immune from discrimination and racism. And tonight, tonight's event I was thinking uh, could be called Imagining an Anti-Racist University. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely right, Abu Bakar. I'm here to take it in and I look forward to the discussions. Um, we've made progress this year, uh, but there's no question that much remains to be done if we want to fully embody inclusion across the institution. And, and by inclusion, I really mean a, a place where everyone can be themselves and feel that they fully belong and have the opportunity to fully contribute to our shared mission. And, and this is really our shared responsibility to always seek to do better and to be part of the solution. And uh, it's, uh, it's inscribed now in our recently approved the strategic integrated plan. We need to renew, we need to revitalize, we need to push for, further our institutional commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. As, uh, as I think everybody knows, and uh, as, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, Professor Sanogo, we're in the process now of developing a broad and ambitious uh, EDI and anti-racism strategy for Carleton. Uh, there's a group called the Equity and Inclusive Community Advisory uh, Group or committee uh, that was formed last uh, spring to oversee uh, this work. It's a very broad and representative group. Uh, and I wanna thank all members of the group for your leadership uh, in, uh, in, in providing us guidance and advice about how to, how, how to, all, how to best uh, take this initiative uh, forward. The work is ongoing. And uh, we're trying to balance, if you will, to respect, on the one hand, uh, the importance of, uh, of broad collaboration and of really doing this well, uh, but at the same time to honor the, uh, the historical moment, the momentness of the moment, as you said, uh, and, uh, and seize the historical uh, opportunity to make positive change uh, in the now. I'm, uh, I am hoping that the action plan will be finalized before the winter holidays. And uh, I do take this opportunity to invite 
everyone to a public uh, town hall consultation uh, tomorrow at 1130. And, uh, and of course, to attend Inclusion Week uh, next week, October 19th uh, to the 23rd. Uh, maybe, maybe to finish, uh, completely by chance recently, uh, I was uh, watching an old interview with uh, the great Denzel Washington. And uh, the, the journalist who was interviewing uh, Mr. Washington uh, was, was clearly hoping for a sound bite and, uh, and uh, wasn't being very straightforward with his questions on race relations and, and was taking to, to, to bring Mr. Washington on the terrain of, uh, of, political, of a political perspective. And, and, and Denzel at one point says, look, you can't legislate love is what he says. The only way forward, he explains, is to engage, to ask questions, to listen, to change. And uh, that's what we're doing tonight. And I'm th thankful to everyone uh, that is involved. Merci beaucoup. Miigwech. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks again for including me and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, uh, President Bacon. I think that your opening remarks already open up things that I'm sure we'll be discussing during uh, our, our session. Uh, one of which obviously is the question of racism as a structure of feeling as such. I think that uh, in addition to the institution, in some way the institutional nature of racism relies precisely on this structure of feeling. So I hope we'll be able to talk about that during our conversation. So with that, so thank you so much for really these uh, wonderful remarks. Uh, which obviously are the, almost the launch pad, the, the official launch of multiple discussions that we'll be having at Compton University throughout the year and throughout the years to come about really uh, anti-racist uh, strategies within the university. So without further ado, I'll now introduce my panelists. I have three panelists. I'm going to introduce each of them in turn and then uh, ask them to make presentation of uh, so uh, of sort of uh, any attempt to make the presentation they have uh, 10 minutes each to make a presentation on a number of questions uh, that um, uh, were asked so uh, the first uh, panelist is going to be dr daniel mcneil uh, who's an award-winning writer and professor Following the success of his first book, Sex, Race in, Sex and Race in the Black Atlantic, he was appointed the Ida B. Wells Barnett Visiting Professor of, Af of African and African and Black Diaspora Studies at DePaul University in Chicago. He joined Carlton in 2014 as the first the strategic hire in migration and diaspora studies. Uh, in 2015-2018, he received research awards for building sustained connection across Carlton and its local, national, and international partners. In 2018-19, uh, Daniel was a visiting professor in the Department of the Humanities and Harriet Tubman Institute for Research on Africa and its diaspora at York University in Canada. And of course, in the past, the last year, he was 2019, 2020, with the inaugural holder of the Public Humanities Faculty Fellowship at the University of Toronto. Currently, he's an associate professor in the Department of History at Carleton, where he's cross-appointed with uh, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Institute of African Studies, and the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture. His most recent book is entitled Migration and Stereotypes in Performance and Culture. Our second panelist is Dr. Xiaobe Chen. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, she's a professor of sociology and associate chair in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. She's the president of the Canadian she was in, of the Canadian Sociological Association for 2020-2021. Her research and teaching interests include the sociology of childhood and youth, governance and power, citizenship, racism, colonialism, um, the Chinese diaspora, and Buddhist social thought. Her latest book is a co-edited volume entitled The Sociology of Childhood and Youth in Canada. 
and she currently works uh, research and community engagement around anti-Chinese, anti-Asian racism associated with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Our last but not least panelist, as the president uh, mentioned, uh, is Ottawa City Councillor Rawlson King, who is a graduate of Carleton University demonstrate perhaps the great work that we do at Carlton. Um, and so Councillor King is uh, was elected the first ever Black City Councillor in a historic by-election held in April 29 for the Rideau Rock Cliff Ward 13 in the city of Ottawa. Prior to that, he was the president of the Overbrook Community Association and the inaugural co-chair of the Ottawa Police Service Community Equity Council. In his first year in office, he was successful in securing funding for the city's anti-racism secretariat, which is an initiative that was requested by the community and spearheaded by him. Uh, so Community Rolson holds a BA in, of Journalism and Law and an MA in Communication, as I said, from Carleton University. So we really have a fantastically and distinguished, fantastic and distinguished panel for that. And so I have asked the panel to reflect on the following questions. Um, one. How do you think the work you do around race, racism, anti-racism help us make sense of the urgency and the stakes of the contemporary moment? Two, what do you think are the nature and forms of racism that prevent slash create obstacle uh, to the emergence and existence of an anti anti-racist quality and city. Three, what kinds of initiatives, ideas, approaches, methodologies, strategies, tactics can help further an anti-racist project in the city or polity more broadly? Finally, what roles and what responsibility do both the city broadly understood as urban space and quality and the university have in working toward the advent of an anti-racist uh, uh, city or world. So uh, each of the presenters is going to have roughly 10, 12 minutes to tell us what they think about these questions. And uh, so I'll start with Dr. Daniel. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Abu Bakr, for those introductory remarks and those wonderfully expansive questions. Um, there's no way I can hope to address all four of those in 10 minutes, um, but I've maybe thought about some ways um, I might respond to the first one that you generously shared and invited us to think through. Um, how do you think the work that you do on race, racism and anti-racism helps us to make sense of the urgency and stakes of the contemporary moment? Now, my first response to this question is going to make me sound like a horribly obnoxious historian, um, but, and so I'm going to apologize for that in advance. Let me see if these come through. But it's really to help through, think through this idea of a historian's lament or a historian's sorrow song. And my hope is that it will help us to think through how we frame racism and how we often think about racism as something that's intruding upon us, as something that's worthy of a new story describing black excellence or black pain or black suffering. And I'd like us to think through how it may be more productive, morally as well as politically, to analyze how racism has been embedded in our institutions. 
And secondly, perhaps more imaginatively and more hopefully, how can we spark reflection? How can we fan the spark of hope by thinking about a black radical tradition? How does a black radical tradition demonstrate how racialized groups have been excluded, marginalized, imagined as lesser breeds without history? But also how does it step back audaciously into the past to imagine a healthier future? How does it help us think about a tradition that is ceaselessly in motion and pointing towards a utopian future? So just briefly, what do I mean by a historian's lament or sorrow song? It's basically the way many of us historians respond to events and spectacles by asking, haven't we been here before? And I think what I'm trying to get at is my desire well, my unease with the desire to frame things as new, addressing a new situation, which often comes at the expense of repressing or suppressing how we've been here before. Not just in well-known struggles against racist policing and racist union organizations in Detroit in 1967, whether that was connecting with student movements that organized walkouts to acknowledge and recognize Malcolm X's struggle, whether that meant thinking through how to develop a Dodge Revolutionary Union movement to connect the music of Motown, the creative artistry of Broadside Press, the poetry of Dudley Randall, um, but also how can we look closer to home? How can we look at how sometimes this desire to frame things as new is part of a suppression of examples in the 1970s, for example, of Canadian newspapers such as the Globe and Mail that when Canada was thinking through and debating a green bill on immigration, attempted to construct Caribbean migrants and a Caribbean diaspora as violent, hypersexual anarchists. Uh, what you can see here on the PowerPoint is page three of the Global Mail in April 1975. This is the first half of the page and the second. So what I try and do in my work is think about a black radical tradition. And this is wonderfully expressed by the painting you can see here from Aaron Douglas, uh, which was uh, entitled Building More Stately Mansions and in concentric bands of muted colors suggests waves of history and knowledge that link the black builders of the pyramids, temples and churches to the black constructors of skyscrapers in the 20th century, and all pointing towards a utopian future. In short, I see the work I do as urgent in seeing that many of the events we're grappling with are not just contemporary, Right? that their clarion calls to contest historical erasure, the reminders to consider a tradition that refuses to be oversimplified, the signs of a rebel spirit that is being passed on to the future. And I'll just say a few words about how I see this in relation to my work on a black rebel generation in London after the Suez crisis of 1956 and a widespread belief in uh, global culture that Britain had lost an empire and failed to find a role. Hopefully this will speak back to Abu Bakr's introduction of Raymond Williams as well, uh, who's writing in this context. So here you can see an image of two 
individuals standing in front of a wall that has graffiti KBW, uh, which stood for Keep Britain White. And in the next slide, you'll see um, the adverts and listings for lodgings that equated people of color and members of an Irish diaspora with noisy pets. Uh, in the popular imagination, this is often remembered as signs that said no, no Blacks, no Irish, uh, no dogs, not just no children, but no dogs. This dehumanizing, this attempt to uh, stigmatize and marginalize immigrants and racialized groups. So what was some of the political responses to this, to these material situations? Well, in the 1960s, British politicians debated the merits of an immigration policy that offered a quasi open door for subjects of a British Commonwealth. For members of the far right Monday Club, who believed in white minority rule in South Africa, but um, believed in white majority rule in England, uh, Britain was a white country that needed to be defended against non white immigrants. Such um, political commentary retreat achieved and received intellectual and ideological legitimacy from cultural gatekeepers such as Hugh Trevor Roper, a distinguished professor at Oxford, who placed European identity and literacy as a necessary condition of belonging or selfhood and relegated Blacks and Africa to zones of non-being, without reason, without history, simply problems for whites to solve rather than people facing problems of anti-Black racism. Another example would be Sir Christopher Masterman, who also alleges that there is no sign of reason, civilization in the quote unquote dark continent. But, Beyond doubt, the most famous um, political intervention, political speech that articulated this threat in relation to English cities, rather than an abstract idea of Western civilization or England's green and pleasant land, came from Enoch Powell uh, in 1968 when he was the Shadow Defense Secretary for the Conservative Party. He carefully prepared a speech that he hoped would fizz like a rocket and capture the nation's attention. His speech made the case that one, assimilation and integration were not possible. Two, this lack of assimilation and integration would lead to violence. Three, that the real victims of attempts to enforce integration and assimilation were ordinary, decent, white English people. Fourth, that the English people were not consulted about immigration. And last but not least, that the answer to these problems must lie in a reduction of the size of the immigrant or immigrant descended population. Now, if judged, um, purely on the basis of the positions he held he, as a parliamentarian, Powell lost, right? He was fired by the conservative uh, leader, Ted Heath, um, the bastions of the British establishment, the Times newspaper, considered it an evil speech. Um, and he was seen as someone causing trouble rather than a prophet of uh, common sense or um, reality. But in another sense, Powellism won. It shaped the discourse of managing minority cultures and led to a fetishization of numbers when people talk about immigration. Right? Um, outside of the House of Commons, as MPs debated Powell's speech during a race relations bill, 1,000 dockers marched on Westminster to protest against what they considered the victimization of Powell. 
The next day, there were other mass demonstrations of working class support in London and Wolverhampton. Over 70% of the respondents of a Gallup poll claimed to agree with Powell's speech. By the end of April, you know, less than a week or 10 days later after his speech, he had received almost 120,000 letters, overwhelmingly positive. And I think we also see Powell's legacy in popular musicians such as Eric Clapton, who is a useful example of how people can have an appetite for black music while expressing hatred for black people in British cities. Clapton's vicious language, um, drunkenly expressed in a concert in 1975, after he'd achieved commercial success, um, imitating, copying, recording, but one of Bob Marley's classic hits, sparked a rock against racism movement, which had local offices across British cities, as well as international offices in Sweden, America, Australia, and over 15 other countries. And it's a good example of people coming together in politically infused acts of pleasure, right? So at a time when multiracial performances were, were, were rare, uh, black and white often perform together. And this is a example of how newness enters the world, right? So how punk and reggae could help to create musical styles like Scar. But there's also a sense, um, and I'll, start to come to my conclusion here, that people were fighting to claim their right to exist in the city, right? So a good example of the street battles that took place in neighborhoods in London in August, 1977, when you'd have clashes between a far right national front, um, and anti-racist campaigners. Uh, at the, while this street battle was going on, Bob Marley's music blurred out of a window. Um, this way in which Bob Marley is helping people to, well, helping to misappropriate and appropriate the artificial or abstract language of the UN Declaration of Human Rights and putting it in the hands of ordinary people to be contested, right, on British streets. And a good example, again, of um, how people are mobilizing or coming together to think about how they can express uh, their sense of belonging in British streets comes after Margaret Thatcher, the leader of the Conservative Party, claims that it's perfectly understandable that ordinary, decent English people feel that they are being swamped or polluted by non-white cultures. And again, people take to the streets, take to concerts to express their opposition to these types of attempts to marginalize and manage minority belonging, this attempt to construct racialized groups as alien wedges. And so one of the questions I have emanating from the ones that Abu Bakr shared with us is this sense that in the UK, you can have a sense of lived multicultures, vibrant polycultural spaces in cities that people have struggled to establish. But this has also brought to the forefront how these convivial multicultures are often defined or imagined in opposition to a rather nostalgic uh, notion of England's green and pleasant land, right? So people have a notion and an understanding of the nation as Downton Abbey or this, these cast of uh, white characters from historical pasts but not the examples of multiracial people who talk to the countryside to express joy, pleasure, 
in music during the summer of love in the 1980s when rave culture was so significant to expressing a generational structure of feeling. And I think I'll leave it there, but that was probably a question I'd have for us to think through is, as we're starting to work, struggle towards imagining anti-racist cities in Canada, how will they work with and against the rather unconvincing narratives of top-down federal or corporate multiculturalism? Thanks so much. Excellent. Thanks so much. You've given a lot to chew on um, in terms of, in particular, in relation to a, a different context, but not so a different context because the history of Britain and empire is so profoundly embedded in the history of this country as well. So uh, we'll move on to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Shelby uh, Chen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Abu Baka. Um, I want to start by thanking um, FAS for this opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to let us to be on this panel uh, for modeling this, uh, uh, this uh, city university initiative. I also appreciate this opportunity to reflect together with my co-panelists about how to build an anti-racist city at this juncture. And thank you, Abu Baka, for your very generative uh, questions. My remarks reflect my work around um, anti-Chinese, anti-Asian racism. I have worked very closely with the community in the last while with an ad hoc Chinese Canadian professors group and also with the Ottawa Chinese Community Service Center. I have learned lots from these collaborations, so it's uh, great to have this forum to share some of, uh, uh, of things that I've learned from that. And one main point that I want to start off with is that there has been a sharp upsurge in anti-Chinese, anti-Asian racism and hate since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are some unique vulnerabilities and the unique harms when it comes to Chinese Canadians' experiences with racism. So to respond to Abu Bakr's first question, the situation is very urgent. Based on a survey conducted by Angus Reid Institute, we can estimate that 50% of Chinese Canadians routinely experience verbal assaults and 60% of Chinese Canadians change their daily routines to avoid attacks. The Chinese Canadian National Council has also received reports of more than 600 incidents since February. And almost 30% of the reported incidents involve a form of assault, including targeted coughing, spitting, or physical violence. Many of us are increasingly uncomfortable when going about everyday life. It is tough to talk to our children about these attacks as well. And uh, uh, in Ottawa, in the last week, a number of incidents of racist attacks were reported in the media. At Rideau Center, Justin Tan was told by a white male that being forced to wear a mask makes him want to kill Asians. On Somerset Street, a man chased, shouted at, and spit at a Chinese woman. And outside the street in Bar Haven, Peter So's car was spit on repeatedly. At Kowloon Market in Chinatown, two men refusing to wear face masks got abusive and shouted conspiracy theories. And I haste to add that these are just the tip of the iceberg. Nobody really knows precisely how many such attacks have happened and how bad the problem is, because most of the Chinese people do not talk about these experiences. Most just take it, often because of not knowing how to make sense of this, these attacks and what they can do about them in Canada. And some of our most vulnerable community members, the elderly, the relatively new immigrants, 
have the language barrier as well. They cannot make out what was shouted at them. They can only tell from the gestures, the voices and the facial expressions that something awful and horrible was, was said. They also don't know what support may be there for them. This is one example of many factors that make them reluctant to speak about their experiences and to seek help. So um, I'm, uh, as a sociologist, I, have, um, uh, I can uh, talk about these different forms of racism. And one observation that I would like to share is that uh, on the one hand, we have overt attacks. These are incidents that come to mind when we think about uh, what I just mentioned earlier, the examples of people being refused to service, being coughed at, spit on, pushed, and beaten. The media has, come, uh, has covered some of this, and the many Canadian politicians have condemned reported incidents uh, of such uh, as well. However, most are silent about um, the structural, systemic, and uh, covert anti-Chinese racism. While we pay attention to overt incidents of attacks on the street, which we can often see thanks to our cell phones, let's not forget that what we're witnessing is a structural shadow pandemic of racism that's caused by the escaping the Chinese narrative. We are witnessing irresponsible politicians, lobbying groups, and some media use and promote inflammatory commentators, uh, co commentaries using terms such as the Chinese virus, the China virus, Wuhan virus, and the CCP virus. CCP stands for the Chinese Communist Party, basically calling the COVID-19 the Chinese government virus. So the Chinese uh, have become the scapegoat of our time. And we have to keep in mind that, that um, um, a lot of people fail, refuse, or fail to make the distinction between uh, people of Chinese background and the Chinese government. That's also one major um, uh, issue. So um, Anti-Chinese sentiments have, because of this, anti-Chinese sentiments have been building in Canada for some time. It has become a go-to narrative and it has become established as a common sense and it has become insidious, it has been, become convenient. We are living in a time of geopolitical shift with China's rise in economic significance with the tension between China and the US escalating Chinese scapegoating has become an easy weapon for politicians and for some in the public to grab, to profit from, and to, um, to shift blame and anxiety to. Add the inability or refusal to separate the Chinese background from the Chinese government, the result is Chinese Canadians get blamed for Chinese government's problems. A recent Canadian example is a global news report which painted a distorted picture of Chinese Canadians, alleging that they helped China's communist government stockpile PPE supplies with intentions to sell later for profit. This report misrepresented the efforts of Chinese Canadians buying PPE for their relatives, friends, and hospitals in China in January and February 2020 as sinister acts directed by a foreign government. It defamed and dehumanized the Chinese Canadians. It refused uh, the fact that the Chinese Canadians can be humanly caring towards the relatives, towards uh, uh, the friends in China. It has contributed to further prejudice and anti-Chinese hostility, adding fuel to the ugly trend of scapegoating the Chinese. As some commentators have, have observed, any Chinese Canadians who has higher education will now be faced with the question, who do you work for? This is one form of systemic racism that is on the rise in Canada. It is often insidious, 
subtle and the elusive. That question often will probably be, not be asked openly, but it will be asked and it will have consequences. Even though these are not a fist, spit, slur, and they cannot be reported to the police, the xenophobic scapegoating narrative is what is at the roots of the rising Chinese, uh, anti-Chinese, anti-Asian violence. It is troubling to us that uh, many would denounce attack incidents on the street, but then choose to be silent about the root cause, about the structural issue, about the Chinese scapegoating xenophobia. So coming to the third point, how to build an anti-racist city. Racism is about dividing and it is about power. So uh, for me, an important answer to it is solidarity. I approach solidarity with some insights from a Buddhist thought. And to me, social, social solidarity is not just about strengthening the us in an us versus them struggle. Rather, it is about compassion and working together to see our connection and a codependency and to, to dissolve otherness. Our differences in backgrounds, in ideological positions, sometimes, often, deter us from making conversations happen. We are afraid of awkwardness, rejection, and hurt. We must go beyond our familiar surroundings, be interested in other groups' experiences, talk to people from different backgrounds, build relations, and build understandings about experiences of oppression and marginalization. We also must uh, work to foster an environment where people are interested in, feel comfortable about seeking mutual understanding and the mutual commitment to each other. So um, in terms of roles and responsibility that the city and the university have, two thoughts that come to my mind is uh, to help uh, uh, efforts in community capacity building and to help with public education. The city and the university, uh, I would really like to see um, we work together to cultivate a rich, richer and a more substantive ties and uh, that community engage the teaching and the research to be valued even more. Um, there should be, for example, support um, um, building communities capacity to carry out anti-racism work. For example, help uh, to help community organizations to build a team to interpret and coordinate help um, that uh, victims of racist attacks need. And um, we can also have collaboration to address those ideological structural issues through public education. My work with the community has made me really appreciate the great need for public education programs. In the past few months, we have developed the Understanding Racial Discrimination Series for Chain Radio's Mandarin program, and it has been very well received. So um, I would urge the city and other levels of governments as well to support public education programs to help Chinese Canadians and also to help uh, the public, to inform the public about uh, racism as a structural issue to inform the public about East Asian communities in terms of the diversity, the contributions, and to cast aside prejudices against the Chinese and the Asians as, as perpetual foreigners. And I will also mention that both the white majority and the East Asians need public education to understand the problem with the model minority myth how it uh, distorts East Asians' experiences, hides Asian fails, and is weaponized against the indigenous Black and other groups. And specific to immigrants from mainland China and their children born in Canada, the Canadian society and even other Chinese communities need to abandon the binary conception of um, them as either villains of the Chinese uh, or accomplices of the Chinese Communist Party or as victims of the Chinese Communist Party. The problem is that mainland Chinese Canadians are often slotted as either 
of those uh, opposite categories of villains or victims. If we do or say anything that does not fit the image of victims of the Chinese government, then we are suspected to be working for the Chinese government. We should be understood on our own terms. Our range of experiences, relations, beliefs, and the positions deserve to be heard, understood, and accepted. We do not want to be acceptable to Canadians only when we present ourselves as victims of the Chinese government. We have our own criticisms of the Chinese government, but we also have complex views as opposed to a single view. So these are some of the things that um, we can do together to counter anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism in our city. I think my time is up. I will uh, look forward to discussion um, after Councillor King's speech. Thank you so much for this really uh, touching and wonderful presentation, which also raises very, very significant and, and foundational problems uh, uh, for us, which will inevitably address uh, in the question question time. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'll uh, give the floor to Councilman uh, Rolson King uh, to respond to the questions and, and tell us uh, his reading of the situation. Well, thank you, Professor, and I'm really appreciative of Carlton giving me this opportunity to uh, discuss uh, an issue that is uh, uh, near and dear to, to my heart, which is addressing in a serious way, uh, anti, uh, you know, addressing racism, um, especially around uh, governments and, and how governments respond. Uh, the work that I do concerning a race as an elected official really does focus on addressing and redressing current challenges faced by racialized people and, and, uh, and other uh, religious groups uh, due to existing and historical circumstance. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, Professor McNeil is right that, uh, you know, we really do have to look at historical uh, circumstance, uh, especially around the, the idea of racialized people being uh, underrepresented and, and being attacked historically, um, you know, because those historical roots are directly responsible for uh, the situation that people uh, face today. Um, ultimately, I'm in, in uh, public uh, service uh, to, to really seek action in order to exact power to seek greater societal fairness. Uh, you know, I'm seeking change. That's one of the reasons why uh, I ran for office. And uh, representation does matter. And I, I, I'll, I'll really demonstrate this uh, through uh, a story. Um, you know, when I was elected in April, of 2019, I was elected the first uh, black uh, city councilor in Ottawa's history. And uh, everybody was really elated, as you can imagine, in the black community, in racialized communities, uh, you know, noting that this is a, is a major change. And in my ward, just one month after my election, um, you know, as, as uh, this uh, elected official and, and really demonstrating a change, uh, a black family in my own ward, in Rita Rockcliffe, was subjected to a hate crime where a vandal left a message in black paint on their garage door that had a racially charged word followed by get out. Now, obviously, this was not a situation that we would accept. Uh, people, you know, in April were uh, really ecstatic. And then uh, the next month, uh, they were deflated in, in uh, uh, the racialized and black communities. But people saw this as an opportunity for change. And it was not a situation that uh, we accepted as a community or a city. So as we know, unfortunately, Ottawa does have one of the highest rates of hate crimes amongst Canadian cities, according to numbers that have been released by Statistics Canada. In uh, 2018, there were 105 hate crimes reported to police are 9.8 incidents per 100,000 people in the city. After this specific incident in my ward, we moved quickly as a community and as a city to actively take measures to, to address challenges around racism. Now, um, you know, I, the president of, of the 
of, of the university really did acknowledge uh, through uh, Denzel Washington's words that you can't legislate love. Uh, but th that wasn't the expectation of the community, which was really interesting. Um, you know, they saw this uh, horrible individual incident, but they said, what we want to do is to ensure that when we are dealing with our government, uh, that we are seen as equal before it. Uh, and that is usually the, the, you know, the expectation in a constitutional democracy, uh, that there are rights that are afforded and you should be treated equally before your government. And uh, people said that that was not the case. And so, it, so, you know, despite the fact that this is an individual act of racism, the more important thing uh, for indigenous communities, for black communities, uh, for racialized communities, for a multitude of, of different religious groups is ensuring that they are treated equally when accessing services. And, and so one of the first things, and like I said, representation matters. One of the first things that occurred after that scenario was the community coming to me and saying, we want to meet uh, with the police uh, to discuss why we do not have a hate crimes unit. We thought we had one. <laughs> and, and then when questions were being asked, um, there, there was recognition that uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, hate crimes investigations were more diffuse across the police service. And that was done without any consultation. Uh, so as elected official, I was able to bring the community together to sit down with the acting police chief at the time and ask those questions. The community also asked for the establishment of an anti-racism office and uh, to, to deal with a multitude of issues around governance, around economic development, around employment equity. But the key is ensuring that there is a conversation, that there is an action plan that is developed based off of the identification of gaps and problems, and that there is movement in government to provide solutions. And, and so I think that that is absolutely key to ensure that we establish an office to, to ensure that we are addressing, uh, like Professor Chen had said, stri uh, structural issues, the structural challenges uh, that uh, we face as a city around these issues of employment, of health, of housing, of economic development, of governance, and as well to take substantive action around education against racism in all its forms. So as a community, you know, we did identify the need for these changes, the need to move forward. And ultimately, you know, we, we, are, we are really acknowledging the fact that historically we have been unrepresented, underrepresented, and we require greater representation around the, the table and that representation matters. Uh, because if I had not been elected, I'm certain we would not have had a discussion about a, about a, a hate crimes unit being reestablished and potentially seeing that happen. And uh, we would not have seen the establishment of an anti-racism secretariat at the city before discussions around um, uh, racial inequity uh, that had emerged uh, in the summer of this year uh, you know, due to uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. So it is important for us to have uh, people around the table who are seeking action, uh, serious action and real action. Um, I'm, I'm gratified by the fact uh, that uh, we were able to establish the office, that we were able to hire an anti-racism specialist, uh, that we are now uh, in the first stages of, of looking at creating an action plan that will bring community members together around those major pillars uh, to, to uh, ascertain uh, what uh, needs to be done to close gaps um, that, that have been challenging communities. And I'm also pleased that I was nominated um, in the summer as the council liaison for anti-racism and ethno-cultural uh, relations initiatives for this term of council to specifically uh, take on these challenges uh, when they arise. So as an example, to, to speak to uh, Professor Chen's uh, presentation, uh, tomorrow at council, it will be my intention in that role of liaison to strongly condemn those attacks on the Chinese community, the Asian community, 
and to also call for uh, a public education program to start to address these individual acts of racism. And in terms of our actions down the road that would look at more systemic racism to, to look at the consultations or action planning that will take place in November uh, that will engage wider communities about the actions that can be taken. So to me, uh, you know, the personal is the political. Um, all racialized people have experienced um, uh, these, these issues of, of individual racism. Um, I think of uh, Professor Neil McNeil's example, and I, I will leave you with this. When I was uh, growing up in uh, Toronto, uh, we grew up in a very cosmopolitan uh, uh, apartment building. And uh, I would wait for my bus in the lobby every day. And I noticed uh, an older gentleman, uh, an Irishman, uh, who would be of that generation who might have been in the UK and might have heard uh, Powell's uh, River of Blood speech. And you know it was interesting when he interfaced with me and I was obviously very young. He, he, he noted, uh, he asked me, you know, where are your, where, where was your family from? And I told them, uh, you know, we're uh, from the British West Indies. We were uh, from St. Vincent. And he said, you're from an island just like, like myself. He's like, I, I, I was from an island uh, uh, just off the coast of, of England. And, and he had noted that, uh, you know, the thing, the thing that we shared, and I was too young to really understand this, uh, was, was uh, subjugation. He said, you were a British subject too. Your parents were British subjects and we were British subjects as well. And uh, to be true to that phrase, uh, we were subjected to subjugation. Uh, and, and it makes it interesting to, to think of uh, Mr. Latimer who, who passed away and um, who got ill uh, when I was uh, younger. Uh, but the fact that we were having this type of dialogue amongst our families um, to bring it full circle. Uh, which, which is really interesting. And, um, you know, having that, that conversation of how to get beyond uh, some of the, of the issues that we experienced in terms of discrimination and, and, and uh, racism, in a sense, um, was uh, truly part, I think, uh, of uh, the Canadian mosaic for, for my parents. Uh, they, they, they thought it was uh, something completely different and maybe something that would only <laughs> take place in Canada, having this type of discussion, but a serious discussion and one uh, where I was engaged with uh, different concepts of race and discrimination from, from when I was younger. Uh, but to me, it is important that we take action and, uh, you know, every day in every way with all the communities, uh, we, we really work towards that. And uh, we want to, to see an Ottawa where everybody is equal when they're dealing with their government. So, so that's what we're really striving for. And, and, and we want maximal input to do that so that we can really see structural change. Uh, thank you so much again for another uh, really uh, I open in mind opening uh, presentation. I was not aware, in fact, of this, these statistics about Ottawa. Uh, it doesn't seem like it, but I'm glad uh, you brought them up along with all the actions that you are involved in, in terms of really looking at the various aspects of governance um, and various dimensions, various the the. the broad domain, so to speak, of racism, which attacks obviously every field of life from government to employment to housing and, 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 and to lived experience itself and how uh, you're trying to work toward uh, addressing some of these questions. Uh, I'm gonna just ask you a couple of questions before opening up to the public. So we are already 8.09. Uh, just on the, just one question, I guess, from to each of you on the basis of your presentation. One thing that Daniel said at the end of his presentation, I guess it's a question that he posed to us, but I want to pose to him and I guess to everybody in, on the panel, is this idea of corporate multiculturalism as in fact uh, one of the responses that we're having precisely toward this moment 
Uh, everybody believes now that Black Lives Matter, everybody's wearing a t-shirt, Black Lives Matter. I saw on TV yesterday, Black Dads Matter uh, for selling some, I don't know what, some kind of product. Uh, and so to what extent uh, is really uh, some of the actions that we are taking and we are hoping to really so profoundly transformational are uh, also running the risk of being recuperated or being, let's say, uh, the term in French is détournement, of facing uh, the concept of détournement, that is sidetrack really from the objective and the ambitions that we're trying to have, which is to construct something, uh, something of a beloved community, as Martin Luther King would say the word much of the same. In other words, in some way, it looks like the corporate world seems at the aspects of the corporate, I can't accuse everybody, certainly aspects of what I seem to see empirically seem to see, to feel that there is potentially even profit to be made of the Black Lives Matter movement. Why not include it in our move, the word expanding more and uh, the word expanding more. Uh, our business a bit more and, and so on. So, so, so what, what are the dangers of, let's say, in, in some ways uh, of almost uh, taking off the ruptural nature of the moment, which yes, we agree, it's structural, but it is manifesting itself in really a, with a particular force at this particular moment. And it's literally uh, expressing the desire of the contemporary generation, at least, to say that enough is enough, uh, that the entire, in fact, edifice of the social contract itself needs to be interrogated. And so all the actions that I've heard from, from, from each of you tend sort of resonate with that. But there seems to be a, resp a corporate response, so to speak, to the kind of beloved world that we are imagining that really actually sees something, things somehow potentially a little more cynically, so to speak. So I'm wondering uh, what uh, you would have to say about, about, about that. Um, so uh, I think uh, Professor Chen also highlighted the question, I think, which is really, really important and it leads, alludes to some of the things that we are saying. Uh, in other words, the question of the spectrum of visibility and invisibility of racism. As Daniel said, it's true. We are, we've been there before in many other contexts both in Canada itself and around the world, in the US, in the UK, in Europe, and so on. And so, uh, to what ex so, so it's almost linked to the primary question, but to what extent can we make this moment mean more than we've been there before? Can we, to what extent can we really make it genuinely, profoundly, rupturally transformational, if you will? Um, and then I guess uh, the, uh, the question that comes from, from uh, Council, uh, Councilman King, of course, is this idea that uh, representation matters. So the fact that we now have uh, black public officials, either in the city hall, sometimes in government and other places, obviously also plays an important role in really attacking these questions to the root. Now, I'm also, uh, based on my knowledge of uh, US history, black history in the US having lived there for a decade, is also the sense that there was something of a kind of civil rights generation of black leadership that found themselves, yes, in with the levers of power, of institutional power, whether in the city, in parliament, in different places, etc. that somehow in spite of such presence, the structural problems remain. And so we, in the, the US case is one case in point. We had the first black president of the United States, yet it was under his reign that the Black Lives Matter emerged. And so uh, 
how do we make sure that these questions of representation also uh, address attack some of the root causes of that so that there's no disconnect between, let's say, the public officials and the streets, so to speak. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there if you want to, uh, each of you or together respond to these three questions. And then I'll open the floor. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Chen. Sure, yes. I'll try to respond to to um, some of your questions, not all of them, they're yeah. all great. Uh, but, uh, um, I think what you, um, the first question you posed about uh, corporate multiculturalism, that, that is uh, definitely something uh, we have seen, I guess, since uh, multiculturalism uh, has been adopted as a um, policy uh, in the sense that uh, it attend, it uh, works to depoliticize, right? To um, a large extent to, to hide the fact that the racism is a structural issue in, in Canadian society. So I think, uh, uh, and then another side of your question is the co-option of this moment, right? How to, uh, how this uh, rupturing power is now being taken away being um, seized upon by corporations and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes for profit and sometimes for uh, good reputation, right? Social responsibility, res reputation and so on, but all to the benefit of the corporations. I, I, I think um, it is uh, something that always happens that uh, there, when there is a political energy, a progressive um, uh, change is shaping up, but there's always the the you know the 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 the, the tendency to co-opt it mm -hmm. and to make it docile and to, to make it to work um, uh, to the um, other agendas purposes so that I'm I guess we can't um, stop it from happening but uh, one thing that I I find uh, is uh, uh, what we need to is to insist on the question of um, uh, of uh, politicization, right? So this is about power. This is about uh, representation, as you said earlier. And that would be one avenue of addressing the power imbalance. And uh, who are at the table to make decisions uh, actually about what to include, right? What, uh, what to celebrate, who to include, on what terms? Those are the fundamental questions that often got uh, elided uh, when we, uh, uh, you know, focus on uh, j just to be, um, uh, be um, our attention, our attention get taken away by, by just the symbolic gestures. Mute myself. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, who else would like to take up? Uh, yes, Councillor King. <laughs> I can't, Councillor King, you're, you're, you're muted. Yes. Yes, Sorry about that. Yes, go ahead. So I was going to say I was going to hazard to, uh, to weigh in as well mm. on uh, the notion of multiculturalism. Mm. And we know as a policy, it welcomes newcomers to, to our country mm. and expands the notion of citizenship beyond language, ethnicity, and historical mm. colonial ties. Um, you know, in a sense, it was a way to, to modernize and something that is... Uh, you know, actually etched into our, our, our constitutional approach, which is why it's so important for me to, to uh, really push for a greater equity at the city and to have this equity office. You know, multiculturalism as a consequence really demonstrates Canada's resolve to evolve as a progressive society uh, when it was, uh, you know, enumerated in the 1970s, 1971, 1972. But multiculturalism being a social value must naturally demonstrate a capacity to constantly evolve to address uh, issues such as immigration, as example. Uh, so as a policy, multiculturalism cannot be static. And it cannot just be a, a, an exercise, I think that this is what you're getting to, a brand identity for a country. It has to be something that is 
real. It has to be more than a mechanism to appease uh, immigrant communities uh, because of uh, poor uh, social and economic conditions or to create a greater electoral appeal uh, for governments of the day or to create a, a, a branded vision of, of change. Um, you know, that's, I think, in vogue with a lot of corporations to show that they are progressive and they are, they are changing. Uh, you know, I think of uh, 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 fossil fuel companies that do that a lot. You think that they're on the leading edge of something that's progressive in the way that they're marketed, but they're just marketing coal and, and oil. <laughs> and I think that we have to have a real vision uh, that multiculturalism must be a social value that really endeavors to make the promise of personal opportunity and socioeconomic betterment more open, inclusive, and accessible to all, regardless of ancestral origin, race, religion, creed, or language. So as an example, today, a Canadian-born male who belongs to a visible minority group earns about 18% less than a Canadian-born white male with similar education and experience. And for women, economists note that that wage gap is even wider. And more acutely, according to uh, Statistics Canada, to a Statistics Canada study, Black Canadians are pay, paid less on average than, than whites. Second generation Blacks, now think about this. So uh, the, the children who are born here uh, face a wage gap of about 10 to 15% compared to uh, uh, non-visible minorities. So in my estimation, in the face of these realities is evident that an evolving multiculturalism policy must evolve beyond crude oversimplifications of culture mm -hmm. as only being about festivals or cuisine or, or, or cultural history, mm -hmm. which leads to pointed overemphasis on the otherness of visible minorities and easy stereotyping about expressions of cultural identity and religious belief. Instead, to me, multiculturalism should evolve through political action towards providing fair access to equal opportunities for all visible minorities and racialized people so that they have a fair chance to, to contribute to the social, economic and political fabric of our country. And, and so that is some of the thinking behind, some of the philosophy behind uh, this anti-racism office to say, we need to have access to greater fairness if we are purporting to be a multicultural society. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, you asked us to think about, what was it? What are, what are the roles and responsibilities that the city has? But I think this, these questions that you brought up also help us to think about what duties we have as intellectuals. So how do we push what may be merely professional and routine into livelier and more radical directions, right? That could be confronting, contesting, bland, anodyne multiculturalism um, that, that tries to fix multiculturalism and not acknowledge how it's messy, unruly, how newness comes into the world, right? How it's felt. Um, but it could also be contesting the idea that everything can be commodified, even social justice, right? It can also mean contesting the idea that multiculturalism is only about policy rather than politics, right? So if it's about politics, it's about how are these things contested, fought over, and not just imagining an elite or some form of elite that gets to say how people's affairs should be managed, right? If, if that's one way of thinking about policy. And then also, I mean, as Councillor uh, King mentioned, he's talking about um, connections to a uh, Caribbean diaspora and St. Vincent in particular. I, I went up and got this book by uh, Richard Eitan, a uh, wonderful inventive, creative text by a Montreal-born scholar of, um, who has links and ancestral connections to St. Vincent. And he invites us to think about a post-civil rights moment 
and to say that there was a danger that people assumed that politics was only about formal politics. And what he invited us to do was to think about how power is not just located in the boardroom, but in the festival stage. And that's partly that, you know, what I was trying to get at with thinking about Bob Marley is this idea of how power is shaped and conveyed in the way in which people carefully listen, in the way in which people go to underground raves, if they go to concerts and think carefully about new ways of belonging with space, time and each other. And that's one way of, of thinking about our responsibility to imagine the arts, to imagine the humanities, to imagine um, what are some of our responsibilities in passing on, in fanning that spark. Um, and I know that I had the, the image of Aaron Douglas, um, but I was thinking about uh, connecting it to say Walter Benjamin. So we've talked about one of the projects that we've been thinking through is how to avoid disarticulating uh, colonialism from anti-racism, right? We, one of our projects is to, to avoid that disarticulation and to put people into these separate camps and not think about how they're talking to each other. Uh, and so really, you know, definitely thinking about uh, how these unruly spaces are areas in which people are able to come together who may not otherwise have done so, who may be passing each other, you know, on the, in the elevator, uh, waiting for the bus, etc. And they're finding ways to come together and go to places that they wouldn't previously have imagined. And that's one way in which we can really imagine and cultivate a healthier uh, sense of convivial multicultures. For sure. Excellent. Thank you. I will segue into some of the, I think this is a good segue into the first question that we have in the chat from my colleague, Malini Gua. And it obviously has to do with the land in which we are as well right we are in unceded territory we are in a land uh, that uh, has prospered through obviously the actions of colonialism uh, we are in a settler colonial context and so the question therefore of uh, the linkage precisely between anti-racism and that question that long history of the country in which we live in and the implications of the colonial in everything we do, everything we are, the air we breathe, the, the structures we work in, uh, the thinking we produce, the language we use to produce that thinking are all obviously tied inextricably to an originary colonial violence, to an originary colonial destruction, uh, to genocide, etc. And so to what, how can we precisely put this particular moment in conversation with that long durée of, of, of the history of our country, of the country in which we live, uh, so that we can genuinely reimagine from the ground up uh, another kind of society another kind of city, another kind of way of imagining uh, uh, policies of, of a togetherness, of conviviality. And so on. Um, I want to say that uh, I really appreciate this um, question and uh, it got me think about, um, uh, I guess I have a, a few thoughts to share. One is that, um, uh, what does it mean? I think for me, it means that uh, we ought to reflect on how colonialism and the racism together have shaped the Canadian society as we know it, has shaped where we found ourselves positioned in this, uh, in this space. And um, you know, scientific racism, uh, European racism, was is a, a crucial instrument uh, for uh, for the colonial project 
right from the from 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 the very beginning. So for that legitimizing uh, legitimizing it and for instrumentalizing it. So I think these two um, cannot be understood and challenged uh, separately. And then another thought I have in mind is also to think about uh, for um, non-indigenous groups to uh, to really critically confront our complicity um, in the colonial project um, as well through our migration roots, even though our migration roots themselves often Often our colonial stories um, as well, uh, a result of conditions in home countries that have shaped greatly by colonialism in the last 500 years. So I think uh, um, complicity and as well as connections, those are the things that, um, uh, that I find um, probably uh, a very of great interest to me in uh, thinking about this question. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, Daniel or Councilor, you want to speak? I don't know. Do you want to address aspects of this? Well, I would uh, just briefly say uh, that uh, obviously there was real tension between um, institutions that are rooted in colonialism and the decolonization project. Um, and we can see that with uh, discussions around the police. Um, you know, I was uh, on a panel discussion earlier this afternoon uh, where we were discussing uh, the impacts of, of the police. And uh, there was uh, an indigenous social worker on that call who was noting that, uh, you know, there, there are these uh, inherent contradictions because we're trying to improve an institution that uh, to the indigenous community uh, was a tool of subjugation. So we're going to have these direct conflicts. Um, it's going to be uh, very challenging uh, because uh, we work within, especially in, in uh, the uh, political environment with hierarchies and rules and, and, and regulations and laws and structures. And uh, you know we're seeking reformation of those structures, but within the system itself. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is going to take, this is going to create uh, all these inherent contradictions, uh, which will be challenging to, to deal with, but I think uh, will be uh, something that we will be able to uh, shine uh, greater and illuminate, um, you know, these challenges, these issues, and, and really have real discussions about uh, the, the historical uh, roots of, of, of these institutions and, and have real conversations. And that's, that's one thing that I am seeking, uh, real conversations in communities on how uh, these institutions uh, will ultimately evolve. Um, so uh, there, there, are these inherent, there are these inherent challenges, but I think what's healthier now is that we are having serious conversations about uh, the limitations of, of, these, of these structures and, and uh, greater conversations on uh, how they they, they might uh, evolve. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, then we like to say last word before I move on to my next question. Yes. Okay, um, very briefly, um, two ways I'd approach this wonderful question from the leaning. Um, A, do we continue to imagine the healthy self-regulating citizen as a settler colonial subject. I think that's one way in which we can start to mm. unpack that question in terms mm. of it's inviting us to think about how the healthy self-regulating citizen is defined against um, the foreign state that is seen to be a rogue state. It is defined against um, the individual or subject who is seen to be bereft of history or failing to perform or embody a particular mm. idea or uh, fixed notion of 
Canadian identity. Mm. And that's, that's why it's helpful to think about scale. So it's helpful how that's contested in some spaces such as um, uh, Toronto or Ottawa, that, and the same strategies might not be as successful in, for example, Sweden. Right? So helpful. But then even um, to think about how we transcend or contest this, again, Richard Eitens' book, In Search of the Black Fantastic, is really helpful at pushing these questions. Um, just to briefly paraphrase from one of one of the powerful sections in the book, mm. talks about if coloniality and anti-racism are imagined as separate, as disarticulated, as only possible of struggling against in isolation, then they cannot be recognized, contested, and transcended. And so it's inviting us to think about how we understand mm -hmm. modes of governance, modes of uh, marginalization and suppression that enforce similar tactics. For him, he's thinking about Jim Crow, segregation, racism in the United States, the benign operations of racial democracy in Brazil, the way in which the United Kingdom and France talk about race as a matter of a colonial past. Uh, in Canada, it's something that happens elsewhere, right? So all in which how do we bring those things into conversation rather than be, to come back to the corporate multiculturalism aspect, mm -hmm. even the official multiculturalism aspect, how do we contest the idea of being subjects that only articulate these demands to the state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different audiences different connections that may be on local or translocal uh stages thank you very much excellent um so i'm gonna go through uh, um, a few other questions here um so I'm going to maybe just, just just run through maybe a couple of those to make sure we get through as many as possible. One says, could you please elaborate on linguistic discrimination and racism against immigrants of color in the Canadian workplace? So that's one. Um, uh, as representation matters, so for this uh, question, yes, representation matters. How can we truly expect an anti racist city to be imagined when decision makers do not reflect the makeup of our city? And furthermore, whose lived experience are so vastly different from those who experience the majority of inequities. So let's do that. So one, okay, anyway, go ahead. I, I'd be happy to uh, take on the, the first question around linguistic discrimination and racism mm -hmm. against uh, immigrants of color in the Canadian workplace. I mean, I see this as uh, functionally in uh, the city government as being a structural issue um, not just an individual issue, though that that mm. does uh, predominate in, in certain cases because uh, we hear that in every workplace. Uh, mm. But uh, you know, structural change uh, is necessary to ensure that uh, more people have an opportunity to work at the city of Ottawa, as an example. Mm. Mm. Um, so uh, most uh, job competitions, as example, at the city, uh, ninety percent of of those uh, those competitions come from internal hires or for people who are already working at the city. 10% uh, are, uh, you know, that, that new intake. And it's difficult if we're not seeing, uh, you know, uh, those uh, um, um, racialized groups uh, being successful in the intake, then we're not going to see uh, a wider number of people in the wider workforce. And that's something that we are actually experiencing. Uh, because I believe uh, the city has uh, a, a racialized uh, workforce count of 12.5%. Uh, that does not uh, align with the 25% uh, 
of, of racialized uh, of a racialized population uh, in the wider city. And so, you know, we need uh, structural changes, and, and those are uh, complacent upon changes in labor agreements, um, uh, you know, changes in, in hiring practices, in, in seeking out uh, equity seeking groups uh, to participate in job competitions to ensure that more Indigenous people are, are, are also engaged in those, in those competitions, and to ensure that there's, uh, there's proper training um, once people are, are hired into positions uh, so that they can, they can advance. So I do see that as, as being uh, truly a, a structural uh, challenge. Um, you know, we need to have uh, tools in place and that's one of the issues that the anti-racism secretariat at the city of Ottawa will be examining is uh, how can we uh, address some of the structural issues uh, that, that, are in, that act as a hindrance to, to people um, entering the workforce and being able to uh, participate in, in, in a real way. And I think it's, it's something that is important to look at, um, you know, since uh, uh, government does constitute a, a large uh, proportion of the workforce in Ottawa. Uh, it's also uh, important historically um, because uh, we've seen, uh, like the stats I had, had noted, uh, you know, uh, poor uh, income levels, even for second generation uh, 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 black uh, citizens in this country. And the same uh, repetitive changes, uh, same repetitive stories in a sense uh, that I think that need to be addressed. Um, though this is outside of the scope of municipality, I think of the, of the um, uh, personal anecdote of my, of my parents. Uh, they were both teachers. Uh, they came to uh, Canada in the 60s. Um, at the time, uh, my, my mother got her teaching certificate at the University of West Indies at Mona. So she left the island to go to another island to, to uh, do her, her, her scholarship. Um, at the time, it was considered a Black university. So the Black professors could not mark that final exam. So the final exam went to Cambridge to be marked by white professors to come back to the island to, to bestow the grades. She received her certificate, came to Canada. And, um, you know, when she applied for a job at the, at, at the uh, Board of Education in, in Toronto at the time, uh, she was told that her credential was not recognized. Um, and, and at that time, I believe, uh, if you were in Ontario, uh, you could have undertaken a six month course and taught courses, uh, you know, uh, taught uh, children in, in schools. And you hear the same types of stories of highly educated immigrants uh, who come to uh, this country. So the first job that unfortunately that my mother had to take after that length of, of education was working in a factory, a uh, paint factory, I believe. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, a couple years later, uh, or, or, or a few years back, you know, I opened the Toronto Star and I read stories of uh, new immigrants who are highly educated, who are working in factories in Toronto. So I think that we have to, we have to really look at real ways of breaking, uh, you know, um, uh, these patterns, ensuring that people have access to real uh, uh, opportunities, economic opportunities, mm. and, and that they are not uh, prohibited mm. by that uh, because of structural issues, mm. uh, which really constitute systemic racism. Mm. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, anecdote in particular, because it resonates a lot with my own uh, personal experience of, of uh, being a sort of uh, you know, my wife works as the Ministry of Ontario Public Service, and so there are ways in which you can see migrants coming to Canada and highly, highly, highly trained who unfortunately have to demonstrate the value of the path to the training in the, in the country of origin and somehow have to go to retraining sometimes for a year, two, three and actually never managed to, to, to pursue the kind of work that they, they, were, they were doing. In fact, so coming to Canada is a kind of almost a social demotion, so to speak, for them, as opposed to an opportunity to, 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 to excel and improve. So thank you so much. Um, yes. Um, um, yeah, the, uh, if I 
May Jiangping, I just want to briefly respond to the to the two questions um, about the linguistic discrimination. I, I think it's something that is probably no way to um, say how it's like. Uh, I think it happens um, in different forms. Uh, for example, um, there has been research that showing that people with foreign names. Mm -hmm. Um, are rejected at a much uh, a greater rate than uh, typical, uh, you know, uh, English or, or, or French names. Mm. So that's one one thing. And uh, what I was um, talking about in my uh, in my uh, presentation was more about how it's uh, a barrier to services. And still is uh, a lot of times, and uh, and a barrier to full citizenship participation, because uh, even though nine one one, I think, uh, and some other uh, emergency services can now be accessed, um, you know, in um, multiple languages. That's very, very, very limited. It's uh, you know just really in a very few areas, and and. Um, and um, when uh, the community services uh, for for uh, uh, for um, racialized people dealing with racism, often they need uh, help in, in uh, like in the case of uh, the people that I talk to in Mandarin. And uh, that's uh, often very, uh, very, uh, very limited and very taxing on the resources of community organizations. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is is also that uh, uh, to how to help uh, new immigrants on the understand um, um, how this uh, democratic society works and and uh, uh, how these uh, bureaucratic processes uh, all these uh, legal systems uh, how how do they work? A lot of uh, resources are not um, available in, in in the in the language and uh, uh, so. Uh, their linguistic um, this um, linguistic uh, um, uh, issue become a, a, a barrier, and uh, in workplace, uh, I think there are issues. Um, they, these days, it probably more come um, out as micro aggressions. Um, for example, um, one would. Uh, I think often this assumption to be um, less competent, right? If one speaks with a with an accent, and um, that often happens, uh, you know, uh, in classroom. I think uh, I can speak about that uh, from personal experiences. Um, and then distance, right? Um, um, your your colleagues may just want to may just not want to be around you or or, or socialize with you. Uh, I, I think those um, linguistic issues maybe have some accent, uh, accent maybe have, do not speak perfect English. Uh, those then become um, um, issues um, and become grounds for um, micro exclusions and micro invalidations. So that's how um, uh, how uh, I, th I think it works in, in, in workplaces uh, a lot of times uh, these days. Um, and uh, the question about uh, representation in the city, that's a really crucial question. Uh, I don't uh, have a simple answer on, or solution rather than just that we so uh, desperately need to drastically improve the composition of decision makers as Councillor King, as a personal experience has uh, testified to that. And I think a foster um, um, indigenous, uh, black and other racialized uh, young people's interest in politics, in civic leadership, that's, uh, that would be important too. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, would you like to say the last word? Um, yeah, I guess it's coming up to our bedtimes. Um, so, uh, just very briefly, I, I think the question of representation is important, and I'll just maybe speak to it in terms of thinking about even the constitution of our panel, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
it could come at it from a academic perspective and think about you know what do we miss from not having geographers involved in the panel who can speak to redlining for example uh, what do we miss from not having the voices of people from architecture and urbanism those kind of questions are quite interesting but I think one thing that's been giving me a little bit of pause I think on ease and it came out from being part of um, diversity conversations is one concern that I have is that there's a goal of diversifying and having lots of different racialized groups around the table uh, but very rarely are people talking about class and socioeconomic class and so aside from the academic question of what academic departments are represented or aside from questions around what linguistic groups are represented or what languages we speak in. It's also a question of when we talk about an anti-racist city, how do we avoid a situation where people are merely swapping lots of white middle-class individuals around a table for racialized individuals who are also bourgeois or middle class around those particular things. So how do we encourage and cultivate uh, cross-class dialogue so that it's not seen as simply um, acknowledging or accepting certain middle class norms around uh, thank you so much. This is absolutely uh, crucial as an intervention, of course, even for us as a in this uh, discussion around healthy cities and in terms of the relationship between the the university and the city. I guess the second aspect of my the framing was really precisely that we sort of establish a kind of hierarchy between the city and the community. Uh, of course, the community is also, we must remember the space of genuine knowledge production, even if it does not take the forms that we know in academia. And I guess part of the challenge that we have here, again, because it's in fact, we having this discussion precisely because, as I said, of the streets of the community. And I think part of the imperative here is also to see how we could reimagine even the university itself by taking by thinking about how to include, not simply include more perspective, but even reimagine it in relation to what we refer to as the community, so to speak. I guess these are methodologies and epistemologies and, and so on that we obviously need to also uh, take into account here. So we could go on and on and on, but it's already age 52, it is very late. So I would like to really thank my distinguished and highly articulate and eloquent panelists for really sharing their thoughts and positions with us. I'd like to obviously thank uh, uh, the participants who asked some really wonderful questions. And I would like, of course, to, 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 to thank the people who were behind this event, who are the Faculty of Art and Social Sciences, our own faculty, uh, for really initiating this event uh, that demonstrates precisely the inextricability of the relationship between the city and the university. And having Councillor King among us uh, further demonstrates as both a counselor, <laughs> as a city person, and as a product of the university is the perfect link, in fact, that is made here for us. And we hope for more discussions uh, around the city and the university. But of course, as far as we are concerned for this particular moment in this particular issue, that this continues to be taken up. So we should open ourselves to the city, open our classes to the city, to the community, so that our knowledge, our ways of thinking, and so on, um, you know, get expanded precisely in relation to the fighting anti-racism. And of course, we hope to be able to have more occasions to go into the city physically or in various other forms, being ourselves in habitants of the city to contribute meaningfully to making life in it more breathable, so to speak. So thank you to all. 
And uh, yes, I uh, hope we'll meet again on the battlefront. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.